Hola, buenas tardes todos. This is Abelardo de la Peña Jr., Director of Marketing and Communications of La Plaza de Cultura y Arte, welcoming you to today's session of En Casa con La Plaza Cocina. La Plaza de Cultura y Arte has been bringing these virtual programs to you uh, since March, well, actually since April. Uh, of course, during the pandemic, we stay at home, but we still need our culture, we still need our, need our history, we, st we still need our, our sabor. And every Monday we have En Casa con la Plaza Cocina in which uh, we have the best chefs, uh, restaurant owners, caterers, and historians and cooks coming on and giving you demonstrations of some wonderful, uh, the sabor mexicano. So if you're on Zoom, please use the comments section to let us know where you're viewing from and uh, use the Q&A to ask questions. We may ask them during the session or, or afterwards, but please ask those questions, make those comments. Let us know where you're viewing from. On Facebook, the same. We're on Facebook Live uh, on in Casa uh, on our website, our Facebook page at La Plaza LA. Start a watch party. Use the comment section to uh, let us know where you're viewing from, and also if you have any questions or comments uh, for for our guest. But we'll, I'll bring to you first of all our host, who's been doing these in Casa con La Plaza co uh, cocina sessions. And um, brings a, a great knowledge of, of uh, Mexican cuisine, and she will be the host for this session. Please join us, Jimena, Jimena Martin. Muchas gracias, Alberto. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining us, uh, joining us this afternoon. Today uh, we have a very special season coming up with the holidays and masa. Um, Northgate was kind to help sponsor um, today's series, and uh, we'll be making champurrado and memelas. Um, today we have our very special guest, uh, Go uh, Maite Gomez Rejon, uh, founder of Art Bites. Uh, she presents art and culinary history through lectures, cookings, uh, cooking classes, and tastings in museums uh, across the country. Uh, BFA from the University of Texas in Austin, an MFA uh, from the Art Institute of Chicago, a Grand Diplôme uh, from the French Culinary Institute in New York. Um, she has presented in the Today Show of uh, Food and Wine, KCRW's uh, Good Food, and NPR's Splendid Table. She also has uh, contributed, uh, has, I can't speak today, has uh, writing contributions to um, Life and Time, Eaton Magazine, um, and also you can find her essays in um, Mexican early cookbooks that appear in the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Latin American History. So without further ado, i uh, pass it over to Ms. Maite gomez Rejon. Hi, Maite, how are you? Yeah, thank you, Jimena. I'm, I'm good. I'm excited to be here as always. Um, yeah, to talk about corn, masa. It's the season of, of tamales, but tamales are so time consuming that I figured let's make something. There's so many different things that are made with masa in Mexico. Um, so I thought we'll make some um, memelas and we'll make some champurrado, which is a chocolate corn-based drink that is so uh, popular at this time of year around the holidays. It's warm, it's hearty. Um, but before we do that, I thought I'd share a little history of masa, of corn, of maíz in, in Mexico before, you, before we get started. Um, so should I, should I just jump in? Just start, jump in. Just jump in. Just jump in and do it. Um, so corn is really is the life force of the Americas and is just imbued with so many religious symbols and chocolate as well. So the champurrado that we're going to be making is basically an atole, which is a corn based drink. Um, it's basically corn and water is how it was how it was used, you know, in pre Colombian um, Mexico and champurrado is a chocolate atole. Um, but it's so interesting both corn and chocolate are the most important crops of Mexico, both imbued with so many religious symbols. Corn is life. Um, it really is the, the, the basis of everything. And in Mayan myths of creation, masa is very significant. Um, so when a child is born or was born, the umbilical cord was cut over a corn husk. And at death, a little ball of masa was placed in the mouth of the deceased. So it was a symbol of the beginning and the end of the cycle of life. Um, and it's such an interesting crop. I mean, it's it's 
It requires full sun to grow, um, but it does it. It needs help to be pollinated because it has this corn husk. It's just it's not going to, you know, a bird is not going to take a seed and fly, you know, fly away with it and drop it. It really requires um, cultivation. And so they were, you know, the Mayans were doing this, the Olmecs were doing this, um, and then cut forward to the Aztecs. They developed uh, the system of chinampas, which was essentially these floating islands that were, um, you see it in near Mexico City, Xochimilco, it's just right, right outside of Mexico City. They're basically these floating islands that were anchored to land and they were growing. Um, they basically figured out this inner interlocking uh, system of growing different crops. Um, so this was life. They were using it to make tamales, to make all sorts of corn uh, masa based foods, um, and also atole, like I mentioned. And um, again, it was. And what they did with this masa is they. It was the perfect food. Um, they developed this system of nixtamalization, which is essentially what brings out all of the nutrients needed in the corn. Um, and this is something that was developed around 1500 BC in Guatemala. So not only Mexico, this is also Central America. And this is basically, they added lime, the mineral, to the boiling corn and then use that to, and then grind, uh, ground that in a metate to create the masa. By doing this nixtamalization process, it brings out all of the necessary nutrients in the corn um, and together with beans it was essentially the perfect food all of the protein all of the minerals all of the amino acids needed was in this one uh, perfect food this nixtamalization process is very specific to mesoamerica and is not something that made its way to europe post-conquest it, it's just something that's very specific to mexico um, so for the mayans it was, it was everything. It was the beginning and the end of life. And by the time we get to the Aztecs, they had so many different gods. I mean, many different gods related to corn. And depending on the life cycle, it was either male or female. Um, the overall god was Senteotl, that was, uh, was male. And then the, the different cycles of the plant were male and female as, as it grew. So it was life, it was life. Um, and chocolate is kind of the opposite. I mean, in Mayan cosmology, where corn was referred to as mother, the masa was, was mother, it was everything, um, needed a full sun to grow, chocolate needs shade to grow. Um, so it, it, so it's, it's the exact opposite. So masa or corn is life, and essentially cacao is death. So both of these together in a drink like champurrado is essentially life and death in one sip. Um, so it's such an, an interesting drink that we don't really even think about these days, but in pre-colonial Mexico, it was everything. And chocolate was very, very expensive. It was a drink that was reserved for aristocrats, for nobility, mixing it with masa, which thickens the sauce it gave it you know, another level. And the way that it was consumed was with water. The chocolate was unsweetened. Um, so it was a bitter water. The word chocolate cho comes from the Nahual chocolatl, which means bitter water. So it's this bitter water thickened with masa. Today it has, it has um, cinnamon. I have some cinnamon here. Um, it has um, piloncillo, which is like a dark brown uh, sugar, um, and it's made with milk. And the chocolate itself is also, Mexican chocolate is quite sweet. I'm going to make a version with water and unsweetened chocolate and masa. So the, the way that it was, the way that it was done originally in pre-colonial Mexico. Thank you. Thank you. Before we get started, we have some saludos from Adrian from Amarillo, Texas, uh, Susan Levano from Fullerton, California, Brenda Lizardo from Chico, California, uh, Phyllis Michaels from Ventura, Clay Gorbet from Lomita, and uh, we have some folks from uh, Roberta Martinez from Pasadena. She says, greetings from Pasadena. Um, wondering if you've heard of cookies that are actually made from masa. 
that are called contomales. And of course, an old uh, volunteer, Lira del Rios uh, from Claremont. Um, Brenda Carmona. Uh, and also Lola, saludos de Lola. Um, she's asking about uh, where we can find unsweetened chocolate. Oh, this chocolate that I have here, actually, it's so pretty. This was a gift from a cousin, and I think he got this in, in Michoacan. Um, but I think you, I think you can find it at, in at like a Mexican market. Um, it's just as long as it says, you know, unsweetened chocolate. This particular one was, um, was a, was a gift, but it's really, it's really, it's really interesting. Cause it's so, it's basically, it's dark chocolate. Um, but it's different than your regular dark chocolate that you buy. Cause it's much grainier. Um, it's much, it just, just, it's just thicker and, 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 um, heartier. More delicious. It's different. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely <laughs> delicious. It's definitely delicious. Um, are there any other questions before before we jump in and start? A lot of saludos. Speaking? Victor Zuniga from Inglewood says saludos. Uh, Wendy, um, as I'll say, saludos from Burbank. So we have a lot of folks watching us today. So okay. please, please continue with the champurrado. Okay, so we'll make the temporada, but I also wanted to mention, so we're making the memela. So there's lots of different, um, like I said, at this time of year, it's usually tamales, but they're again, they're quite time consuming. And it's usually the time when a bunch of people come together and make them. Um, and, but the memelas, there, there are lots of different types of holders of, 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 of meat or of beans or of vegetables. Memelas are just like little chubby corn tortillas. With, it, they're basically like little boats with little tall sides, which I'm going to be making today. And that's what they're called in Oaxaca and Puebla. Um, then you have a similar type of type of dish in Yucatan. They're called panuchos or salbutes. Um, and then there's also sopes in central Mexico, chalupas in northern Mexico. So depending on what part of the country, um, they're, it's a similar type of dish. I'm just going to be, you know, toasting them, cooking them on a dry skillet. Um, sometimes they're fried, gorditas, which means chubby. They're, they're stuffed. Um, so they're either fried, you know, just cooked on a comal or stuffed, but there's the same sort of idea. It's a little corn dish um, that's holding beans and that's holding meat and that's holding some sort of salsa or, or chile or just something, something delicious. Um, and again, if you open up a bag, I'm gonna be using this, this Northgate masa, but if you open up a bag of fresh masa, it's sm that smell, um, or even if you open up a bag of, of masarina, the, the corn flour, that smell is very different than opening up a bag of cornmeal, um, which does not have the nixtamal. So what you're smelling is that line, is that nixtamal, um, that that process that is so um, that is so earthy and and just so 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 delicious. Um, so I think I'll just get started on that. If anybody, unless anybody has any any questions, so far just a bunch of saludos. Just a bunch of saludos. Well, saludos. We got Wendy Samaru from Burbank. We got Valeriana Sierra from West Covina. Monica Garcia from Michigan. Michigan. Wow. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Oh, I just want to say thank you so much for telling us about Nistamal because it's such an important science. I don't think people realize the science behind that and how brilliant the Mesoamerican folks were back then to figure out how to break down with the lime to get the full nutritional value. I know it's really amazing because the original corn was something called teosinte that doesn't, it's, it's hard. It, it's just, it, it wasn't the corn that we have today, but by adding this process and nobody really knows how, like how they, how this happened, how they figured that out, Go, dating back to 1500, you know, BC. Um, but it is one of those things. It's like, it's amazing that they were able to figure that out. It brings out all of these necessary nutrients um, just by adding this mineral. It's, and the chinampas, I mean, they the were, yeah. it's amazing. They were like, like I said, floating gardens. They were scientists. And through these floating gardens, they were able to feed um, all the, the Aztec empire through these floating it, gardens. Yeah, it really is amazing. And they're, they're, they're still around in Xochimilco. You still kind of see them. And I think, especially now, there, there are a lot of um, 
farmers that are that are bringing this back. There's this interest. I think everywhere in the world is interesting in going back to basics and going back to the ancestral corns and ancestral, you know, cocos, beans, and all of that. And and so we see a lot of these chinampas coming back um, because they really they give you everything. It's this entire ecosystem on a floating island. I don't think we see that anywhere in the world other than Mexico. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty spectacular. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start with the champurrado, um, which is like, I, again, I said it, it's a um, it's a chocolate atole. And what I have over here is uh, three cups of water that I'm going to go ahead and heat up. I have some black beans back there. Um, so I'm gonna just, it's gonna take a little while because it's a small burner. Uh, so I have three cups of water and then I have about three of these tablets, actually a little more of these tablets that I just chopped up. And once that heats up, um, I'm just going to add this. And when that melts, I'm going to thicken it with about a quarter cup of the of the masa, of the fresh masa. Um, and this is it's basically a porridge um, and it's very nutritious. This particular drink, because of the chocolate has the abroma, which is a a stimulant. It's it's similar to caffeine, but it's not caffeine, but it definitely is a stimulant. By giving somebody this drink, um, I love this idea of life and death in one sip. It's just highly ritualized. You have this energy giving drink, um, and then you have the masa, which gives it you this uh, protein. Um, so it's kind of this interesting drink, and it's it's thick. Um, it really it's it tastes like earth. I love it. Um, so I'm going to just wait for this to heat up. And while I wait for that to heat up, um, and this is just, again, I'm just using water. The, the champurrados that you find, you know, today that are, that are, that are typically sold are made with milk. Um, the Europeans, when they arrived, they really kind of embraced these drinks, these atoles and champurrados, but they started adding milk to them and sweetening them with, with cinnamon, with, um, with cloves, with different spices, and of course with, with sugar, particularly this type of sugar, which is almost like between, the taste is almost between brown sugar and molasses. It's, like, it's, it's much sweeter than, than brown uh, sugar, even the dark brown sugar. Um, so I'm going to just start shaping while we wait for the water to heat up. I'm going to just start uh, shaping the, the memelas. Um, this is the simplest, simplest dish that you could possibly imagine. I just put a bunch of the masa, the prepared masa in the bowl here. Um, but if you have masarina at home, I typically just follow the package directions, add some hot water to it, add some salt to it and mix the dough. The dough should feel kind of sticky to your, to your fingers. Um, and I'm going to use a tortilla press and just roll out little balls about two inches. Um, and while I do that, I'm going to heat up my skillet. Um, so I have just a, just a dry skillet. If you don't have, I mean a griddle, if you don't have a griddle, you could just use a skillet. Just make sure, you just want to make sure that it's, that it's dry. You don't need any, any oil or anything on there. Um, so I'm just going to start shaping these little, these little circles. I love the way that it feels. It's like Play-Doh. It's like Play-Doh. And while I shape them, I'm just going to put them in a bowl here. So they're about two, just about two inch little balls, like little ping pong balls. Um, so I'm just going to set them on in a bowl here and I'm going to cover them just to keep them from from drying out. So I'll make a few of them. Does anybody have any questions or any favorite um, any favorite masa dishes? Well, well, the thing beauty about masa, the possibilities are endless. The possibilities are absolutely endless. Yes, they really there's so many sweet dishes, there are savory dishes. Um, yeah, any, well, I just, you know, backtrack a little bit, this whole idea of the Mayans, and there was a symbol of, of life, and, you know, the umbilical cord of a child was cut on a corn husk, and then the little masa was placed in the deceased mouth. Um, they, the Mayan book of creation is this book called the, the Popol Vuh, and in it, humans are made out of masa. And there's an expression in Mexico, sin maíz no hay país, like without without maíz, there's no there's no country. But in this book of creation, 
Um, the original humans, well, the, there, there were different humans. Um, first, they were carved out of wood, um, and then there was a fire, and they burned down, and then they were made out of, out of clay, out of terracotta, and then there was a storm, and they just disintegrated, and then they were made out of flesh, um, and then they invented war and killed each other. Um, and then the final humans were molded out of masa. Um, so again, it is the life force. It is what humans are made of. And if you even you know look at your hands, our skin is yellow, our veins are blue, we cut ourselves and it's red. So it's all of these different colors of corn as well. So it's there's so many, um, so many hidden symbols in there. And I and most of the gods um, in the Americas were were agricultural, you know, prior to the conquest. And of course, they when the conquerors arrived, they saw so um, many, uh, they basically equated um, masa, they equated corn with their native wheat, which was, of course, the body of Christ. And so they supplanted all of the all of the corn for um, for wheat. So it became this divider of classes, um, which is is quite fascinating. It's just food is so is political, and at that particular moment corn and wheat, that corn divided divided the classes because they understood the importance of it. I do have a question for you, Maite. Uh, Rinda Carbona, she's asking, how are mamelas and gorditas different? The gorditas are stuffed, but it's essentially the same thing. It's essentially, they're all essentially the same thing. Some are stuffed, some are, some are, um, some are fried, some are just, you know, put on a comal. These are, these mamelas are little, are, are basically are, are just our little, little boats that we're making. Um, so I have a bunch of them here and I, I'm going to start shaping them. Unless anybody, I'm going to cover this just to make this go a little bit faster. Um, and I'm going to start shaping these. I can, I can feel that. Um, so I have my, my tortilla press here. If you don't have a tortilla press, you could certainly do this by hand or you could use a rolling pin. Um, I'm gonna lower my heat. I can feel that it's really hot. I taught a class last week and I and I um, had so many things going. All, I, all of the, the fire alarm in the, in the, in the house went off. So I, I, want, I don't wanna repeat of that. Um, so I'm using the tortilla press and I have just, I, I took a large Ziploc bag and cut it. Um, you don't want to put your your masa directly on the on the metal because it's just going to stick. Um, so I'm going to do this as if I were making tortillas, but I'm not going to press too much. I'm just going to keep them. I want to keep them a little bit thick, so you can see that they're kind of thick. And then just lift it like this with the palm of my hand, and I'm going to just place these directly on my hot uh, dry skillet and just let them cook for about a couple of minutes before I flip them over. And the reason that I'm leaving them so thick is that I want to, while they're, while they're still a little bit raw, I'm gonna pinch the edges and create little boats. So if anybody has any questions, let me know. I'm heating up my beans in the meantime. Um, oh, I see the last question about a book club. I would love that. There's so many favorite books. You know, I could share. There's there's one of oh, that I love. Well, there's there's one like the classic, the oops, um, called America's First Cuisines by Sophie Coe. That's a that's a classic. Um, Everything by Jeffrey Pilcher, I think, is also really really great. He wrote this great book called Que Vivan Los Tamales, which is all about Mexican history. He also wrote one called Planet Paco. And he's a, I can't remember where he teaches. Um, Toronto. Toronto, okay. He's in Toronto. Yeah, he's amazing. Um, and then there's a lot of, um, a lot of ones of, of people in Mexico as well. Oh, gosh, I have this one. There's a woman, oh my gosh, how am I not blanking on her name? Um, it'll come to me, it'll come to me. Um, but there's Ana Benitez is one. Um, a lot of Mexican uh, food historians are, are female. 
and there are some just amazing and also so many great cookbooks. Oh, the history of Mexican food is so rich. Mystery of Mexico just in general. All right, I'm going to do one more. And this, there's something very rewarding about squishing tortillas like this. Okay, that's the last one because it's the, I can't really fit any more on my skillet. And so if you notice, I'm just going to move this over. I just have them on here and they move around quite easily. And that's just a dry skillet. These I just put on. So these, I'm going to flip those over and cook them for Mike, a little we have a while. question from Sus. Oops. From, from what? I'm sorry. From um, Susan Leovano, and she's asking, "What do you think about Diana Kennedy's cookbooks?" You know, I've never, I've never cooked from Diana Kennedy's. Um, I don't really know. I don't really know. I mean, she's obviously she, she's look how pretty that looks. They're a little bit brown. Um, I don't know. I kind of have a love hate relationship with with her. No, nothing personal. I don't know her, and the woman's like a hundred years old. Um, she definitely helped shed light to a lot of, you know, to Mexican uh, food um, in the US and in, and in Europe. She's, uh, she's uh, from England, I believe. Um, so I'm just gonna leave this here and I'll, I'll switch over. So I'm not just talking, so I don't feel like I'm just talking to myself. Um, but she, you know, it's interesting. It's that whole idea of she's a, a, a European, you know, woman that moved to Mexico. There is a woman named Josefina Velasquez de Leon. And those of you that have, taken my classes have heard me talk about her. She wrote the first um, cookbook, Mexican cookbook in the US. And Diana Kennedy was inspired by this book. Um, and this is what gave her the idea to, I mean, I'm sure she, she was she was curious about Mexico. I'm sure she loved Mexico, but gave her the idea to travel the country and to collect um, recipes and to and to write her, her own cookbooks. And she's done, you know, so much to the country. Um, but everybody knows Diana Kennedy. Nobody knows Josefina Velasquez de Leon, who sort of gave her this kind of idea. Um, but but she's she's amazing. I mean, she's she's absolutely a a force of nature. I mean, this woman is, I think she's nearly a hundred years old and she's yeah. still working and she's, and she really has, you know, done a lot to, to shed light to, um, to Mexican cuisine in, in around the world, but I've never cooked from her. You've cooked for I, a lot. I from have, her. yeah, I have. Besides, you know, her, she's very, again, uh, these stories go back. So she does storytelling as well. So she stayed at Don Yampara's house and then she, I had breakfast and she made this and that for me. So that's kind of fun when you read like the background of the recipe, yeah, I do but she's that. very, I mean, she's very, she's a purist and it's in the sense I do have most of her books. Um, I enjoy reading. I've done, I have cooked several of her things, but again, the, what I love about some of her, her recipes, either A, they have too many things or they have very minimal. I find the very minimal, minimal recipes are the most delicious ones. Like my favorite is her sopa terrasca. It is the best soup. It has like four ingredients and that's it. Oh, I love that. So it's, you have to kind of pick and choose. Um, but again, I think part of reading, you know, but besides buying cookbooks to cook with, I also enjoy the storytelling that goes behind it. And I think that's what makes her unique. And again, um, kind of just bring an awareness, but I do understand that um, we need to bring our other Latina folks who, you know, in their own right um, to acknowledge them, you know, Diana Kennedy did a great job, but then, um, I'm sorry, what was the woman's name again? The, Josefina Velasquez. Josefina, yeah. we gotta bring Josefina yeah. to light as well and celebrate her contributions as well. Yeah, but it's true. It's, it's all about the stories, really. I mean, I love reading cookbooks because of the stories that they that they tell and what, you know, something that's so great about somebody like Ruth Reichel, you know, who, who doesn't do Mexican food, but she's she's a she's an amazing food writer. Um, the way that you're you're reading a recipe and it and it and you're reading a story and those are the those are the those are the best. Those are the best. Um, I'm gonna just uh, show you what I'm doing over here with these with these little with our, my little boats here. Um, I'm gonna just bring a few over. Whoops. And while they're still, they're asking about your griddle. What is the brand of your griddle? My thing. Oh, it's um, Lodge. They do the cast. It's a cast iron Lodge um, Lodge griddle. I love it, but uh, it's such a pain to clean. But I love it. Um, so what I'm gonna do? This one, may, I may have let this 
leave, left this on a little bit more. I'm going to do it on this side. I'm just going to pinch it. There are also some other ones called base gadas. There's, there's so many different kinds of masas. So this is just, which means pinching. This is hot. Um, so I'm just pinching it just to create a little boat. And then I'm just going to pinch the inside just to make sure that the bottom, um, that all of it gets cooked. And I'm going to stick it back on the skillet. I'm going to do it with all of this. And this you'd want to work pretty fast ah, so that you don't, um, well, there's still, I'm going to put some on here. Um, and try not to burn your yourself. Uh, but yes, I do love my lodge, um, my lodge pan. I'm gonna stick that back on because I just want it a little bit. Um, I want the, I like them a little bit soft. But you see how this already has a little bit brown. This is gonna give this bottom part of it a nice crispy bite to it, um, which I love. So it kind of has lots of different textures within the same, within every bite has lots of different textures. I'm gonna keep pinching and I have a couple more and then I'll move on to my champurrado and I'm gonna keep these on the skillet until the end um, on super low heat just to keep them warm. Any other questions? No. What kind of toppings are you gonna top them with today? I'm just going to do black beans. I just did some refried black beans um, and a little bit of queso fresco. Um, that's it. So really, I'm just going to keep it really simple. But I made them the other day. I sauteed some some crab. I had a little a little container of, of crab, um, and I just sauteed that with a little bit of butter and some um, some some chile and some tomato and onion. Oh, and it, and I put the black beans and then the crab. It was really incredible like really incredible Maite, lola's asking um oh no excuse me susan levan is asking um do you use masa preparada or just plain masa for the memeles this is just plain masa it's, it's just the masa with the nixtamal that's that's what it is yeah just that that just the, the regular your regular corn um your regular corn masa and then we have Lola asking, uh, what are some of your favorite dishes when you visited Oaxaca? Oh my gosh. It's hard to get a bad meal in Oaxaca. I feel like it's the best food in the world. Um, gosh, best meal. God, I love just, I love street. I love street food. Um, just the moles are amazing. We went to this, um, when I was there last summer, I don't even remember what the rest, the name of the restaurant, but it was this tiny little restaurant near the hotel that we were staying and had the best mole. It was just cheese. Um, it was just a cheese and, um, and, and moladas with cheese. Like the, I made those in the last class that, that I, that I did with La Plaza. Um, I'm always trying to replicate that particular mole, um, that, that we had, um, gosh. I would say the mole, they're just the tasting the different moles, the tasting, you know, the, the corn, there's this restaurant called, uh, is it the, the, I think it's called, they just do, um, they just do corn. Um, so they have lots of different kinds of corn, lots of different preparations. Um, that was really special. God, it's hard to get a bad, there's a great ice cream place with these really interesting flavors. It's just really hard to get a bad meal in Oaxaca, I think. Um, so my my water has come to a boil. I'm going to lower my heat a little bit and just add my chocolate just to melt that. And I'm going to just just mix that a little bit. I'm actually going to use this whisk and then I'm going to whisk in the the um, just whisk in the the masa. So let me just put the, my phone over so that you all can see. But Lola, I'd love to hear your your places, your favorite places in Oaxaca. There's so many. It's impossible to get a bad meal there. Um, so this is just the chocolate. You can see I have it on low. I have it on medium, actually. Um, so I'm just whisking it. This is this dark chocolate with water. That's it. And you can see that it's very, very loose. My dad was from Yucatan, and this is how he liked his chocolate. He didn't like it with milk. He liked his, his hot chocolate just with water. I always found it so odd when I was little, but now I just I love it. 
you could just see how liquid, um, how watery it is. And um, chocolate, of course, one of the most, like with, with right next to corn, one of the most amazing crops of the Americas. And um, we could do a whole class on chocolate. Um, but it was, you notice how little, that you, I'm using a whisk, but these little bubbles that we see, this is what they wanted. Um, this is what this little device that I'm gonna use in a little bit was for this molinillo. Its sole purpose is to create these froth in the chocolate. I'm using the whisk only because I'm gonna whisk in the masa. So I'm using about a quarter cup of masa. And then I'm just gonna whisk it in. Or I probably should have broken it up in little pieces, but it'll it'll fall apart. And then if you want it, it's something, if you want it thicker, you could always add a little bit more. So does anybody, anybody watching or are you, does anybody have the champurrada or is this something that you have around the holidays? You start seeing this drink around Day of the Dead. For any questions or comments? Yeah. No, I'm sure we're missing, um, usually for the holidays, you know, for December, we always have my dick come and tell us the history of chocolate. And she has this beautiful PowerPoint presentation. And then she gives us two choices of drinking it vegan, the Aztec way, Aztec chocolate, and also champurrado. Yeah, the, the, this is what I'm making, but with milk. And then, or just the regular, just watery white chocolate. It's, it almost feels like, like a, um, I'm gonna add a little bit more of this. Um, it almost feels like a, what do you call it? A, um, a chocolate, a coffee tea when it has water in it instead of milk. Um, it feels like a coffee tea. But this is something that the word champurrado is something that um, nobody really knows where it comes from. And it's so interesting to me, like the, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna switch the camera over and keep doing this. I um, just wanna make sure everybody can can hear me while I keep while I keep whisking. Um, but there was, you know, post-conquest, there was the Manila galleons, which were these ships that sailed between Manila and the Philippines, um, which was a Spanish colony, uh, you know, as, as, just, just like Mexico was post-conquest. So for 250 years, these ships, ships sailed between Manila and Acapulco in, in Mexico, um, bringing goods in and out of the country. And there's a similar drink in the Philippines called champorado. Instead of champorado with a U and two R's, it has an O and just one R, but it's exactly the same thing. But rather than using masa, they use uh, rice. So it's so interesting how that is a typical drink in the Philippines around this time of the year, um, just like Chaburrado is in, in Mexico. So this is starting, really starting to thicken. And my beans look like they're nice and hot. I can start putting these together. I just put that one giant chunk of masa in there that's taking a little bit of time to dissolve. Maite, we have Elizabeth Urbach. Um, she says that she's, she just made hot chocolate the other day. Uh, she's been researching food in California before the gold rush, and that's how they made their chocolate. Um, the oldest um, Spanish Californian cookbook, El Cocinero Español, was published in San Francisco in 1898. That's from um, Esta Encarnacion. Encarnacion. Yeah, I just had a class on Encarnacion last time. Um, Thursday through the Huntington Library. That's when I set up all the the fire alarms in the house. That is a fascinating, uh, fascinating cookbook. Um, that's so interesting. That the whole California cuisine is a is, is a whole. It's such a fascinating, um, such fascinating history. Uh, yeah. Once La Cocina opens up, I would love to have like a demonstration from beginning to end with El Morcajete. Oh yeah. Okay, the metate, excuse me, and metate, and have the cacao buds on there, and have people grind and to see the process from beginning to end, and then have drink the hot chocolate that has been made from grinding the the beans there within the class. Yeah, that would be a great class, and it's so interesting because it has a it has a skill. You don't just go back and forth. It's it's all in the it's all in the wrist, um, and it's I it's so interesting. Actually, when I was in Oaxaca last summer. I took a, I took a, a chocolate class, and they they showed us how to do that, and 
And, um, and also you, you see it from the cocoa bean to this really creamy, because of when you start grinding it, it has all of the cocoa, um, all of the cocoa butter comes out. So you see it from, uh, so fascinating. That's very, very, that would be a great class. All right, so this is coming along. I think they're finally, finally dissolving. Um, and then I'll show you. I'm gonna keep that going to just a little bit longer while I assemble some of my, um, my melas. So what I'm gonna do is just put them, this is so simple. Um, I'm gonna move this camera over so that you could see, whoops. So you can kind of see actually, while it's there, you can kind of see how, how it's so much thicker than it was when we started. Um, I still have some little chunks of corn in there, um, but I'm just gonna keep this going while I prepare some of my mamillas. I have a little plate here. I'm just gonna put some of my little boats on here. Does anybody have any questions? I lost my spoon. So this is just really, really simple. I just have some, some refried black beans um, that I made. I like to make like a pot of black beans maybe once a month, every month and a half and just divide it and freeze it. And that way I just have it. Um, just, so I'm just gonna put it in my little boats. So this right here is the perfect diet perfect nutritious diet with the masa and the beans. You could keep it veggie, you could put vegetables on it, um, some cheese, which is what I'm gonna do. Just gonna put just some queso fresco. Look at that. With just a little bit of heaven. And then you can put your favorite salsa. I'm just gonna put some some strips of jalapeno. Maite, Susan Heimer is asking what by chance what is the brand of your dish? This dish mm -hmm. is uh, so it's, it's Heath. It's Heath Ceramics, my favorite. I'm obsessed with their, with their stuff. And Lola's asking if there's a trick to uh, making smooth champurrado. Oh gosh, I think you just have to, you just have to keep, you just have to keep whisking it. Um, now mine is actually boiling now. So, but there you go. I think this is nice and smooth. Actually, I still have some, you know, I think what, what needs to be done is uh, put it in a blender. It's just so hot right now. I think if I put it in a blender, it's just going to explode. But um, I think that's probably the best way to do it is just to put it in the blender. Um, do you have a hand blender? Oh, I do have a hand blender. Should we do that? That could work. Definitely work. Yeah, let me just switch this over and we'll bring it a little closer. Um, any questions, Wale? Yes, as nutritionally, uh, would the dish be considered heavy? This particular dish, the memelas or the, or the champurrado? Let's do both. The, I don't think that this would be considered heavy because it's just, it's just the, the masa with a little beans and cheese. Um, I don't think necessarily this would be considered heavy. I mean, I would consider this pretty, I don't think this is too heavy. This is, but the, but the champurrado, uh, yes, I think it's, it's like absolutely with the corn and the chocolate, um, supposed to be, you know, nutritious and, and, uh, you know, protein rich, but yeah, if I have a drink, a, a, a glass of champurrado, a mug of champurrado, all I want to do is go to sleep because it is, it is so heavy for sure. Okay, there's a question on if we don't have access to fresh masa and they use masarina, uh, how much, um, how much water would you add to make fresh masa? 
Yeah, I typically just follow, every brand is slightly different. I typically follow the instructions on the bag, but it's typically about, you know, one or two cups masa to about one and a half to two cups uh, warm water. Um, that's typically what it is. And it's the great thing about masa, masarina is that it's very forgiving. It doesn't have gluten. Corn is naturally gluten-free. So you don't have to worry, like if you're working with all-purpose flour or any sort of wheat flour, you don't have to worry about um, overworking masarina because you can't, because it doesn't have gluten. Um, and so if it's too dry, just add a little more water, just add a little more flour if it's too liquidy. Um, but sometimes it feels like it's too liquidy and you just can just knead, 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 knead away and it will, and it will get there. But it's usually, you know, about one to or two to one and a half to two cups. Um, so I'm going to bring this over to over here and let's try this with the immersion blender because that that'll that'll do it. Have one right here, right on cue. Hopefully I don't get smashed. <laughs> brought the camera over. Let me do that so everybody can see. But yes, this is a quite a very, very nutritious um, dish. Any other questions? Okay, so it's here. Oh, what pan dulce would you pair with champurrado? Oh, all of them, any of them. Conchas, rosca, like a rosca de reyes on January 6th, that's coming up. But I would say conchas. Um, but any pan dulce would do for sure. All right, there it goes. I think that's good. I think that's a smooth champurrado. Um, so that's what we want. Actually, I already created the foam using this, but this is what... This gadget, the molinillo, um, is the gadget that was created just to create froth and chocolate. And the way that it works is you just put it in. It's kind of, I would actually probably, let me just pour it into a, um, I'm gonna pour it into a pitcher here because it's a little bit, it's a little bit um, too shallow to be able to, to use. I'm just pouring it into a pitcher and then I can use it. So it's hard to tell because I already have so much foam in it, but you put it in and you go like this and it creates all of this beautiful, beautiful froth. And that's the sign of a good champurrado or good hot chocolate. And then I'm just gonna pour it into my mug. And there it is. There's your thick glass, not glass, your thick cup of champurrado that pairs perfectly with these guys. It's basically the taste of Christmas. All I need is the tamales and the conchas. Oh my goodness. Um, I think I'm going to have to run over there, get my car and uh, go visit you. Yes. Jimena and I are neighbors. <laughs> so yes, I'm close. You're welcome to. Um, I just see any yeah, other What questions? is the brand of your mug? People like your stuff. People like my stuff. Thank you. Um, I don't know. It was a wedding gift. It's, um, it doesn't say, but it was a wedding gift for my uncle who lives in, um, Morelia. So it's probably from there, but I don't, I don't know where, I don't know where it's from, but thank you so much. And um, was, thank you all. Does anybody have any other questions or comments? I, hope I, just want to say, I just want to say thank you so much. This is amazing. You're our hundredth and one uh, program for our Encasa series. Wow. And thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and our delicious champurrado, las memelas, so comforting, so yummy. I'm seriously, I might have to, this hot, this, excuse me, this very cold, windy day, it run is. over there and knock on your door and get a bite. But delicious, muchísimas gracias, and thank you so much for thank sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maite. Thank you so much, Jimena. We have a few more comments coming in. Thank you. It was great, says Elise Salend. 
Rebecca Herrera says, thank you. Uh, Susan Luevano, great. Thank you so much, Maite. Uh, Catherine Lu Luiz, Luiz, excuse me if I mispronounced your name. Thank you. Enjoy your classes. Happy holidays. And uh, I enjoyed it so much. I always learn so much from you. Saludos, says Brenda Carmona. And Brenda Lizardo says, muchas gracias. Hasta pronto. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and here, Wendy, I think she sums it up for me anyway. So hungry now. <laughs> me too. This is the, 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 the beauty of these demonstrations that we learn so much. But then the down part is that, you know, we don't get to taste them until we make them ourselves. So that's what it's all about. <laughs> We have posted the, the recipe on our Facebook page. We will be sending out the recipe to all of you that uh, joined us on Zoom. So you could get the, the both for the champurrado and for the memelas. Uh, I, we call them gorditas. Like you say, there's many ways to, to, many different ways that you could call them, but they're all delicious and they're something that we have to try. And they seem so simple to make. So let's give it a yeah. try. Yeah. We want to thank Northgate Gonzalez Markets for sponsoring today's in Casa con la Plaza Cocina. Uh, they, they, they did a couple others with us. They did uh, Enmoladas, which uh, Maite demonstrated for us back uh, for Dia de los Muertos. Mm -hmm. And then also um, Empanadas de Manzana con Eliseo Lara back in November, uh, direct from Mexico City, uh, using products from Northgate. Somehow we got him the products from Northgate down to Mexico City. But there's, I'm sure you, if you go to Northgate's uh, website, you could find locations close to you where you could pick up like today's uh, masa and the, the other ingredients that we've used in these ca in Casa con la Plaza Cocina sessions. Uh, for those of you that didn't catch the entire program or if you wanna watch it again, uh, we'll be posting it on our YouTube site of in a couple hours at uh, La Plaza LA, and it's also on our website, lapca.org, uh, and also on our Facebook page. Uh, our upcoming, and you could find all 100 programs that we've done so far, plus a special one we did this last Friday, which was uh, kind of our greatest hits, which included a, a small clip from, uh, from Maite and uh, with the greetings from Jimena. So check it out on our YouTube page, and I'll be posting that on our, on our website and on uh, Facebook as uh, probably by the end of the day as well. Upcoming programs, you can find them on our website. We have two more for the year. Uh, on Wednesday, Yolanda Nava presenting her book. Uh, it's all in the frijoles. It's uh, 100 famous Latinos share their stories, dichos, folk tales, and inspiring words of wisdom. She'll be our special guest on Wednesday at seven o'clock here on Incasa. And then on Friday, the Dan Guerrero returns with his happy hour. It'll be a great holiday special with Luis Perez of Los Lobos sharing Christmas stories and an appearance by Linda Ronstadt, who will be with us live on Friday at seven o'clock here on Encasa Con La Plaza. So thank you again, Jimena. Thank you so much, Maite. Thank Have you. a great holiday. Have some nice time off, and we'll be enjoying champurrado, memelas, tamales, atole, a lot of food during the holidays. So, muchas gracias a todos. Bye bye. Thank you.